Hello, welcome back to the studio. Today, as promised, I'll be using Billy Shoal's watercolor set from Sennelier. Um, I have this set as a sample palette, which was sent to me by my good friend Ev from Ev Bolt Art and Cats. Um, and I will be using this set to paint an abutilon flower. I'll put that up on screen right here in the middle. I photographed this flower at the Phipps Conservatory while I was at the ASBA, that's the American Society of Botanical Artists, conference in Pittsburgh this past fall. I am working from photos, usually I prefer to work from life, but uh, it is the middle of winter in Canada and I did specifically want a colorful floral subject for this palette, so I am going to be perking up my winter with some bright colors. If you're new here, hi and welcome! My name is Lee. I'm a botanical and natural science illustrator in Kitchener-Waterloo, Canada. On this channel, I share watercolor techniques and tips and some insights into my daily life as an illustrator. If this is content that you're interested in, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Unfortunately, I mangled and lost some of the footage for painting the background of the Zabutillon. Although, perhaps that's for the best. It was kind of a chaotic process. I'm not really used to painting backgrounds, and so I was just winging it with an unfamiliar palette, doing unfamiliar things. And although I'm relatively satisfied about how it turned out in the end, <laughs> my process was certainly not inspirational and the footage was probably not great to begin with. So instead, let's just assume that this background happened somehow and jump right in with the footage of me painting the abutilin flowers and bud itself. Following Billy Shoal's advice, I'm defining some of the shadows and form of this abutilon using a neutral gray tone, a botanical gray, so to speak. Billy's watercolor floral portraits book was published before the Sennelier set was released, uh, but the closest three colors to the ones she suggests are lemon yellow, Sennelier red, and ultramarine deep. I've mixed these three colors together to form a deep gray, and now you'll see me applying it wet and wet to start defining some forms. Next, I'll start building up color in glazes. Because the goal of this piece is to learn from some of Billy Shoal's techniques, I'm trying to remind myself to work wet and wet in, and wet my paper first and then let my color wash in. This is a somewhat unfamiliar way of working for me. Apart from my very first washes, I tend to work pretty much exclusively wet on dry and blend out as I go. Um, so you'll see me do a little bit of both as I work through this piece.
the reason I chose this abutilon as a subject is that it has a very interesting veining pattern with some pinky red veins on a yellow petal. I thought this would be perfect for Billy Scholl's technique of first painting layers of wet and wet glazes and then following that up with some dry brushing techniques. However, I very quickly ran into some challenges and realized that I may have bitten off more than I can chew. My first issue was because I was painting this flower life size, the little veining patterns that are supposed to bleed into the yellow, those little areas are actually very tiny, which means that if you're going to be painting them wet and wet, you have to be extremely precise. You need to know exactly the saturation of paint that you have, as well as just how wet you've got your paper. And because I don't do quite as much wet and wet, I wasn't, I hadn't quite mastered that. Um, more often than not, my paper would be either too wet or too dry. My paint would be either too light or too dark. Um, and so my veining ended up looking a little bit messy. I also noticed that my paper in the sketchbook has a bit of a flaw. Now this is beautiful Arsh 140 pound paper. It, this is a handmade sketchbook. However, some of the pages in this sketchbook, and definitely this page that I'm working on right now, they have a bit of a flaw. And I'm not sure whether this is because um, the paper was handled and there's skin oils that got onto it, or whether the paper is simply old and the gelatin sizing has worn off unevenly. Um, but some of the areas of this paper resist watercolor a little bit, whereas others soak it up a little bit too quickly. Um, so that's a challenge that you run into with some papers, and it's part of why <laughs> botanical artists are notoriously fussy about their paper. Finally, I ran into some unexpected issues with dry brushing. Although I do use plenty of dry brushing in my own work, my technique for dry brushing doesn't work so well with these paints. The way I usually work when dry brushing is I spread my paints out on my ceramic palette and apply a barely damp brush to completely dry paint to pick up exactly the color and saturation that I want. However, this doesn't work so well with these paints. As I mentioned in my first impressions video a couple of videos back, um, these San Diego paints seem to need a little bit more agitation to release. They're a little, they have a bit of a sticky feeling on the palette and on the brush and they need to be mixed up with a little bit of water to start flowing. Unfortunately, this means that I have to work a different way. So following Billy Scholl's method for dry brushing, I mixed up a wetter puddle of paint on my palette, picked it up with a brush, and then brushed it off on scrap paper to get just the right amount of dry brushing. But I kept forgetting, so again, some of the areas of dry brush on this piece are a little bit messy. This is, of course, why it's great that I was working in a sketchbook, because although this painting is a little messy, I still learned a lot. Um, and I don't need to feel bad about having a piece that didn't quite work out because that's what sketchbooks are for. This Abutilon study was my very last piece which I completed in 2019 and heading into 2020 I'm looking forward to a whole bunch of new and exciting projects including some large studio paintings that I have planned. I'm looking forward to entering more international juried shows um, and building up my portfolio a little bit more heading into 2020. I also look forward to sharing with you some of what that process looks like. After all, in my intro, I do promise that on this channel I share some insights into my daily life as an illustrator. My art goals heading into this new decade include having my illustration published in scientific journals and having some of my botanical art 
um, included in international public collections. For this channel, I'm looking forward to finding new and creative ways of incorporating um, some of my larger studio pieces into my channel content. Um, for a number of practical reasons, I can't have a camera over my shoulder doing full end-to-end -end paint with me for large botanical pieces, um, but I am looking forward to sharing what that side of my life looks like more with you here. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you what your art goals are for this coming decade. Let me know down in the comments below. Oh, and actually, that reminds me of another art goal. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers here on this channel. My goal was to reach a thousand within a year after my first video was published, and I'm right on track. So if you haven't already, do help me out by subscribing to the channel. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.